So electric lights and something is always a very confusing topic um, because you kind of have to know everything to know any of it. Uh, and so I like to do kind of a summary at the end. And so let's, let's start with how to actually approach electrolytes and acid base. And when I'm talking about electrolytes and acid base, of course, I'm talking about what we've talked about for the past, um, I don't know how many lectures, a week and a half of lectures. So we're talking sodium and chloride, we're talking potassium, uh, we're talking TCO2, which is bicarb, we're talking anion gap. So of course that's actually not a lot of things to talk about, but a lot can go wrong, a lot of different things can happen. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat, no matter who you start with, I'm always going to do potassium last. Of course, I always look at potassium when I have renal disease slash azotemia. Um, but you can approach this in any way that you would like to approach it. I often approach it with anion gap and TCO2 first because I think they're the easiest to explain. So let's remind ourselves how to approach it. So an increase in anion gap, of course, is an essentially increase in acids. And so these acids are represented or due to clue, ketones, lactate, uremic acids, and ethylene glycol. And they automatically tell us that there is a titrational metabolic acidosis. Now, of course, with it, what we expect is we expect to see a decrease in TCO2, which, of course, tells us that there's a metabolic acidosis, which is why some people start with the metabolic, they actually start with the TCO2. Because, of course, a TCO2 decrease can be due to different things. One of them, of course, is a titrational metabolic acidosis, and of course that would be supported by the increase in anion gap. But the other is a loss acidosis, where you actually have a loss of bicarbonate. And that loss of bicarbonate can be often kidneys, it can be through the kidneys, especially acute kidney injury, and diarrhea are the main ones that can happen. And when we see this, of course, we look for that sodium versus chloride discrepancy. Let's see if I can get that a little brighter. That sodium versus chloride discrepancy, where chloride is increased relative to sodium. So just whatever it is relative to sodium, it's greater than that. So you might also see azotemia with that. So again, you can start with anion gap or you can start with TCO2. Now the other option, of course, is an increased TCO2. And this equals a metabolic alkalosis. And of course, with a metabolic alkalosis, we have, we would expect, because what's the driving factor in it, is going to be a decrease in chloride because it's a loss or sequestration of hydrochloric acid. So in this case, we certainly expect in the sodium versus chloride for chloride to be less than sodium, either absolute or relatively. And so we've automatically looked at sodium and chloride in both of these cases, which is why I don't always start with them. And of course, a metabolic alkalosis, what's driving it is this loss or sequestration of, of hydrochloric acid. Now, you can have things that happen together, uh, and so titrational metabolic acidosis can always happen. So this can happen, that increase in anion gap can always happen. TCO2 can do a variety of things, right? So you can have a loss of bicarbonate concurrently with this titrational metabolic acidosis. So you can imagine an animal that has acute kidney injury, so renal, with the loss of bicarbonate is also going to be azotemic, and that could increase your anion gap. 
So that's one possibility. You could also have an animal who has a loss of hydrochloric acid because they have a gastric outflow obstruction, become very dehydrated with an increased lactate, also increasing clue and a titrational metabolic acidosis. So these are all complex disorders. What you don't expect to happen are these two. So you do not expect these two to occur together because of course so that's not happening uh, because our chlorides are doing opposite things. So it's just based on you know the positives and negatives and just the fact that those tend to not really occur together. And if they do, we certainly can't identify them based on blood work together. So let's remind ourselves the sodium and chloride and even kidneys and how that fits into things. So we talked about sodium and chloride and that when they were both high together similarly, this was dehydration. And when sodium and chloride were both low together, that meant they were getting lost. And we said that they could get lost in the urine and that could have been from renal disease. It could have been from osmotic diuresis or even just regular old diuresis more commonly. Uh, it could get lost in feces. And so you can have diarrhea that loses more so bicarbonate, or you can lose sodium and chloride and bicarbonate. Uh, we said that you could third space. And the most common one we talked about, at least in this, was um, a uroabdomen. And then we talked about sweating in horses, but that would be like you need a relevant history that goes along with it. So of course, feces was diarrhea uh, and third space. There's actually a lot of causes, but the main one again was uroabdomen. So of course, in many of these, you're gonna have concurrent azotemia potentially, right? So if it's just dehydration, you can have azotemia that's pre-renal. Certainly with renal disease, you can have azotemia that you expect to be renal. Osmotic diuresis may also, if it causes dehydration, cause um, a renal azotemia, potentially end pre-renal. And the renal, of course, is because you can't concentrate. Feces, so if an animal has severe enough diarrhea, you can, and they become dehydrated, you can see azotemia. Third space, your abdomen, certainly you're gonna expect that post-renal. So this would be pre from dehydration. And sweating out, that's not so much that we would expect that. So just thinking about how you may have concurrent azotemia. And of course, anytime you have azotemia, you can have an increase in anion gap due to clue and a titrational metabolic acidosis. So those are some things to consider. And then we have our situation where we have, so now we have sodium, that's less than chloride, meaning that chlorides increase relatively. And we said that this tells us that we have a secretional metabolic acidosis, which I think without the columns, this is hard to understand. And of course, this is due to a loss of bicarb, which we talked about on the last page. And of course, if you have where sodium is greater than chloride, that would then suggest that you have metabolic alkalosis. And it's very easy to overinterpret these things. That's the job of the clinical pathologist. And of course, that's due to a loss of hydrochloric acid. Now, I saved the best for last, which is potassium. And I like looking at potassium last, although I will look at it in animals with azotemia. And the reason I like looking at it last is, of course, because it, it changes. A lot of things change potassium um, or affect potassium. And so we always have to talk about, because of course we care the most about increases in potassium, uh, but we care about decreases as well, because that's significant. So we have to talk about renal excretion and having decreased renal excretion of potassium. And we can have shifting, so intracellular fluid to extracellular fluid shifting of potassium.
So then why do we get decreased renal excretion of potassium? Well, we have a couple possibilities. One, we have aneuric or oliguric acute renal failure, acute kidney injury. So of course, in these patients, you're going to look for a pretty marked azotemia, maybe evidence of renal tubular injury, maybe no urine being made, lily toxicity in cats, ethylene glycol, you name it. Uh, you can have um, post-renal causes. So these are, that's not really working. Let's try that again. So post-renal things like uroabdomen and urinary obstruction. That's my abbreviation for uroabdomen. And then, of course, a lack of aldosterone, which we haven't officially done Addison's yet, so don't freak out about that. So a lack of aldosterone. And of course, in all of these, you can see azotemia, these two especially. But in an Addisonian animal, they become rapidly dehydrated because of the aldosterone lack, and they lose sodium and chloride because they can't retain them. So again, though, decreased renal excretion of potassium. So you, you're going to have to look at other things going on in our patient. So the intracellular to extracellular shift of potassium, we've only talked about one of the causes yet, and of course that's acidosis, and now you know that you can look at your uh, TCO2, and if your TCO2 is low, that's certainly potentially going to contribute to that. But this really shouldn't be that high. It should be a relatively mild increase. I usually say if the upper limit's you know five, then no more than six. So you don't want shifting to then potentially kill you as a patient. That wouldn't be a good mechanism of safety. And then the other is severe muscle injury. And we'll talk more about this uh, in the liver section of the course where we actually talk about muscle injury. So then let's talk about potassium decrease. And of course, our number one, let's try to pick the same colors. So our number one uh, reason for it to be decreased, of course, is anorexia with continued urination. Um, but you can certainly have increased renal excretion and this most often is from diuresis. It's not really working. Uh, so some sort of diuresis, even animals that are PUPD. And then, of course, you can have extracellular shift to intracellular shift. And we see this with, of course, an alkalosis. And so the animal that has an alkalosis becomes rapidly potassium depleted because they, um, one, probably aren't eating, and they're continuing to pee out potassium. And they have this alkalosis, which is shifting everything intracellularly.